What does ReZero, Spirited Away, and The Wizard of Oz all have in common? How about No Game, No Life, Sword Art Online, and the Arnold Schwarzenegger film, The Last Action Hero? You see, they all fall under the subgenre known as Isekai. Isekai, the Japanese word for a different world, is a genre where someone from our world goes to another world, or someone from another world comes to ours. Typically, it comes with the benefit of fantastic powers or mythical destiny. Over the past decade, these stories have skyrocketed into popularity, with animes like That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime, Log Horizon, Gate, Drifters, Restaurant to Another World, Saga of Tanya, and so, so much more. With one or more isekai anime every season, the subgenre has become so popular that according to kakuyomu.jp, light novel and manga publisher Karakawa actually stopped accepting light novel submissions featuring isekai in 2017 because there's just too damn many of them. And though the term didn't really become popular until around 2010, this is based on trending Google searches, so take that with a grain of Google salt, there's no shortage of shows that fit that description. So how did this thing all start? Well, the whole thing started with Urashima Taro, a Japanese folklore that originated before the character was named in the 15th century. It's about a fisherman who rescued a turtle, who was then rewarded with access to a mythical underwater kingdom. He eats, drinks, and is entertained by the beautiful princess Otohime, given the true hero treatment for his good deed. Now, after a few days, he gets homesick and heads back home only to find out three centuries had passed while he was away. Basically, Urashima Taro is Fry from Futurama. And kinda, you know, think about it. Stories of disappearing for seemingly a few days only to return home a decade or two later aren't unique to Japan. Ireland has a rich folklore surrounding the fair folk with legends and warnings like spend the night partying with the fairies and come back home a couple hundred years later. Yikes. It's not just folk tales too though. Popular novels like Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Peter Pan, The Chronicles of Narnia, the list goes on. Harry Potter could also be considered a soft example of an isekai. Interesting. Now, in Western isekai stories, most people go through wardrobes, popping in and out of movie screens, or even go through doors and trees. But in Japan, you have things like chukkun running over you, crazed man stabbing you, getting run over by a train, reading books, playing VR games, or just playing games full stop. No matter the difference of how they get to the other world, the appeal of isekais is global and has spanned centuries. Still, the only culture to give a name to this specific literary type of escape fantasy was Japan. How did this widely popular genre make it into anime? My girl, Sally the Witch. Who the f*** is Sally the Witch? Sally is also an example of a reverse isekai, but she was the first popular anime to include the genre in any way, shape, or form. According to my anime list, Sally the Witch started airing in the 60s and has had several remakes since then. It's about a girl from a magical world who comes to our boring, mundane human world. Now, Sally was mischievous, Sally was fun. Instead of learning about a fantastic world through the main character's eyes, we learned how fantastic our world could be through someone else's eyes. Inspired by Bewitched, Sally was the first popular example of the magical girl genre in anime and our first taste of how isekai would look in the industry. In fact, the concept of fantastic character coming into the mundane world was such a success it was used in several times all by magical girl shows. Popular examples like Miki Momo, Lalabelle, and Majoko Meguchan all featured the same concept, magical girls coming to the mundane world. Now in 1970, we have Osamu Tetsuka and Eiichi Yamamoto going uh, horny on Maine with an isekai of their own called Cleopatra, where we have the main characters Jiro, Harvey, and Mary using a time machine to transfer their minds into the bodies of people in the past. This is to thwart the plan of evil aliens apparently, and also the dude Harvey's actual life goal I guess is to have sex with Cleopatra. Then we get to 1983 with an anime called Seisenshi Dunbine also known as Aura Battler Dunbai. Now in this story, we have Shozama and his motorcycle, and they get sent to another world to man fantasy mechas. Makes it sound like the motorcycle's manning the mechas. Anyway, after, in the 1990s, is when Isekai really gets a kickstart. With the introduction of an anime called Fushigi Yugi by Studio Pierre. Debuting as an anime in 1996, with the manga debuting back in 1992, the story is about two middle school girls. Miyaka, Yuki, 
and Yui Hongo, who finds a book and are transported to another place and time. Miyaka becomes a hero destined for miracle romances while Yui, who was sent back to the human world, winds up becoming a villain. It's also worth noting that Miyaka actually mirrors a lot of modern isekai protags because, like many of them, she could have been considered an anime otaku in her time. Fushigi Yugi also falls into a lot of the quintessential shoujo tropes of the 90s. Tropes like impossible freedom romance that will eventually prove love can conquer all, acts of self-sacrifice to save the world and confronting your trauma, earning it forced motivation to save others. Sounds like other anime tropes. Anyway, it had all the drama of a soap opera, only instead of live action actors, it was sparkly eyed schoolgirls and pretty anime boys. My favorite. This becomes a template for the modern isekai story. A boring ass mundane main character from a pitiful mundane human world gets transported to another more exciting world in which they are the hero. This is our award winning formula, which is replicated again and again and again and again, and again, and once more for good measures, again. Around the same time, we get our first shonen story in the genre, El Hazard. Though the anime started a full year earlier, Fushigi is given the credit because the manga predates the El Hazard manga. The story is simple. Three high school students and their history teacher gets transported to another world and becomes the pivotal heroes of an ongoing war. This sort of familiar format becomes the new foundation for modern isekai before it was even called isekai. But even with El Hazard, isekai seemed to be a girl's world. Escaflone and Magic Knight Ray Earth both came out around 1996 as well, along with the Inuyasha manga. For one reason or another, there was a story upon stories of schoolgirls being transported into a magical medieval style world. This is maybe due to how popular Fushigi Yuki was. 18 volumes of manga, 52 episodes of anime, an English dub, two OVAs, a light novel series, and two spin-off series. Don't spawn out of thin air. There had to be a demand for them. And over a decade, Fushigi Yuki stayed fairly popular among Japanese girls. It didn't quite have the same staying power in the US, but why wouldn't other studios and publishers be eager to replicate that? And they weren't wrong. Magic Knight Ray Earth has sold over 200,000 copies of the Dark Horse English translation alone. This number doesn't even touch on what it did in sales worldwide or how it performed in its Tokyo Pop release. And this overall doesn't even hold a candle to how Inuasha performed. Mm -mm, no sir. Not only was Inuasha's many Western anime audiences first look at Isekai, it's a series that has staying power to spare. And with good reason. Rumiko Takahashi knew how to write a manga that appealed to both audiences. He had the slow burn romance, anime pretty boys, dark themes, yokai, sword fights, and crass humor. Basically, you had delicious goodies for everyone. Inuyasha was a perfect blend of shoujo and shonen that holds a deep nostalgia for most anime fans growing up in the original Toonami era of anime. Kagome! But. I digress. So why was this sort of story so popular with the shoujo audience? It's been touched on previously, but isekai is a genre about escaping the day-to-day -day doldrums. It's practically designed to be a self-insert fantasy. The idea that anyone normal could be plucked out of their mooring, extremely plain monotony and placed into some amazing adventures is widely appealing, as proven by story after story being created within the genre. But this sort of thing can appeal to everyone, so. Why girls specifically? This could be because girls were painfully aware of the limited power in their world, our world. This sort of fantasy that whisked you away to another must have been appealing when the current reality was, you know, unfulfilling. There's absolutely no shortage of stories of girls being secret princesses. The way isekai is framed in the shoujo genre just takes that a step further. But they're not just the princesses, they're the heroes. They're the key of saving someone or even the world, even if someone they save themselves, it's still far more appealing to do the saving rather than being saved. And it wasn't just isekai that helped illustrate this climate. Don't forget the 90s is when magical girls changed from idols like Creamy Mommy to warriors like Sailor Moon. This all ties in with a very strong girl power movement of the 90s. In America and Japan, there seemed to be sort of a cultural push for girls to stop fitting into some of the meager roles assigned to them. There seemed to be no match for a girl's thirst for power, but shoujo's hold in the isekai genre started to change as we enter the new millennium. The early 2000s brought a landscape shift, literally, with the rise of personal computers. 
The commonality of computers and love of the internet opened up a whole new way to tell an isekai story and new audiences to go along with it. The box office hit of The Matrix and the rise of cyberpunk helped create the perfect climate for the next stage of isekai. As we enter the digital age, so did our obsession with it. Shows like Serial Experiments Lane were a soft transition involving some isekai elements while figuring out how they fit into a digital landscape. Lane stepping into the virtual space known as The Wired and becoming a sort of god because of her connection to it is very parallel to many isekai stories. The ambiguity of The Wired and the fact that other people can access this space keeps many people from considering it a true isekai story. But its ability to combine elements, isekai and cyberpunk elements is a good example of how the genre evolved into the next stage. As computers got better, gaming got better, and the rise of MMOs were unparalleled. And uh, most of the stereotype dictates that most of these games were being played by teenagers and young adults, not preschool to elementary school-aged girls. The stigma of video games was also slowly being lifted. No longer were there something regulated to kids in nerd culture, WoW ran an ad campaign in the mid-2000s that featured celebrities playing the game to help prove that. Now, according to Dr. Randy Olson, lead data scientist at Life Epigenetics Inc., the number of active users on the most popular online MMOs increased to over 11 million by 2006. Even before that, there was a steady increase in players year after year from 2000 onwards. Many MMOs started introducing the idea that you could escape in a virtual world to be somebody else, be somebody better. Isekai just took that idea a bit more literally. People began spending their free time in these massive online worldscapes to break up the monotony of their day to day. You could experience action, adventure, make friends, all from the safety and comfort of a computer chair. Video games provided an escape. Now, all forms of media provided that sweet, sweet escape from the normie world. But it was video games that allowed us to have direct control of our escapism. We had the power to be who we wanted to be. And if you wanted to be a Kermit smoking a blunt with two katanas, so be it. So with that, it only made sense to marry an escapism medium with an escapism genre. Dot hack sign, sword on online, Konosuba. There's a seemingly endless list of main characters being transported into their favorite video games. Some of it a dream come true, some of it abject horror. And though the Dot Hack series is credited with being the first isekai anime to bring the digital world into play, I can think of two others. And uh, don't you try commenting Tron, since I said anime. Digimon aired in the late 90s and was a smash hit in both East and West and brought isekai to a digital age. For anyone that doesn't remember or wasn't old enough to remember the absolute bop that was the US theme song, Digimon, 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 Digimon. Seven Digifriends go to a camping trip for the summer, wind up living in a digital world. Like Lane, it was sort of a middle ground trying to parse out the genre that was gonna fit the next generation of storytelling. On one hand, you have the narrative very explicitly telling you this is a digital world. On the other, it still holds the same sort of feel of some of those way back when fantasy worlds. The second series is one that didn't really make a splash, but it's still worth mentioning because it brings it around to where it all started in anime. Corrector Yui. Corrector Yui is a magical girl show, like Minky Momo and Sally the Witch, but instead of pulling the ye old classic tropes, she's taking a page from the current climate of anime. Yui's an average girl in an average world until one day she's zapped into a computer and becomes Corrector Yui, savior of the internet and slayer of viruses. But no matter how modern and fun the premise was, Corrector Yui's dip in popularity helped signal the end of Izakai and shoujo only. Only 18 of the 52 episode series managed to get dubbed and the manga struggled to find an audience. The oversaturation of the magical girl market in the wake of Sailor Moon's absence created an inhospitable climate for the series to take hold. And thus, it failed. Not that Isekai disappeared from shoujo entirely. We still saw shows like Maho Shoujo Tao Arusu and Sugar Sugar Rune, but we started seeing less Isekai magical girls and more shonen and seinen style protagonists taking on a digital landscape. The rise in popularity of this very specific brand of Isekai could be attributed to needs, not in education, employment, or training. 
and Hikikomori's, aka Shunnets. Japan's Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications estimated the number of NEATs at 630,000 in 2012. And for Hikikomori's, the number is at an estimated 560,000 from a Japanese government survey released in 2016. Now, granted, these two aren't the only reason why isekais are such a big deal. To top it all off, in 2018, the Japan Times reported that while jobs are available, wages have stagnated. With an increased cost of living, less and less are able to afford the life they want and are just scraping by with their basic needs. And also, there's a famous Japanese saying, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. In Japanese and most Asian culture, individualism can be discouraged. It's best to just be another cog in the machine. But if Isekai's popularity had shown us anything, it's that this ideal is often rejected. People do want to stand out, to be different, to be the main character of the story. With a generation of young adults increasingly dissatisfied with the way their lives are turning out and turning into video games and the internet in general as a means of escapism, it's only natural that the light novels, mangas, and animes would follow suit. It helps that many of the modern day isekai protagonists are Hikikomoris, like Kazuma from Konosuba, or Nataku, like Naofumi Watani from The Rising of the Shield Hero. It's easy to find yourself believing in this escapist fantasy if the main character is like you. Isekai is a genre fueled by the desire to leave the mundane behind, to run away from our current situation into a better one even if that better one is more dangerous. Despite the escape, there's something to say regarding the danger, which bring in aspects of thrillers and horrors to the isekai genre. Is it really better to live in a fantasy world that's much more dangerous than the mundane one, where it's slightly dangerous, just less dragons and shit. Many stories downplay the danger though by giving their characters overpowered abilities to combat it. I think uh, ReZero is basically anime Groundhog Day, while something like Overlord, our main character Momonga, is literally one of the most powerful characters in that universe. There are obviously Isekai series that go against the OP grain, but if you're the main character of the story, you should be fine. Early shoujo Isekais all featured our heroines returning home after they saved the day, while modern day Isekais split. Some of our heroes choose to stay, others to go back home, and others have no choice. And maybe that is saying something about the audience they're designed to appeal to. The escape from the shoujo perspective helped convey a more classic hero's journey story and functioned as a coming of age story in many cases. It was all about growing up and getting stronger with each battle, while the escape from a modern isekai perspective reflects a desire to literally escape to run away from everything boring and to be better. This doesn't even touch that half of these stories wind up turning into a harem show at one point or another. There's aspects of witch fulfillment in both stories, but shoujo encourages to take those wishes and turn them into a reality that fits into the mundane world, while new isekais seem to place these wishes firmly in the realm of fantasy. Now, no matter how it evolves next, the genre that spans centuries is showing no signs of dying out anytime soon, despite the bans against their submission to certain production companies or writing contests. As long as our boring, pitiful, plain mundane world is devoid of dungeons, adventures, big old harems, and UIs popping out with your skill trees, I think there will be plenty of isekais to go around. But as you watch one of the new isekais, just remember all the shoujo godmothers that started this whole genre. A whole genre of a different world. All right, and that's all for today, y'all. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, tell me, what are your favorite isekai shows? Let us know in the comments below. Be sure to like, comment, again, subscribe, press that <laughs> bell icon, and stay tuned every other Friday for more video essays. Bye-bye now. I'm gonna go back to my world now. Yahoo! <laughs>